you're cutting into my time. <laughs> if you ask a hundred people what the most important scientific event last year was, 98 of them will say that it was the solar eclipse this past summer. The other two, my partner and I, it was the day we turned on the power in our totally off-grid house. <laughs> this is a picture of our house, almost completed. There are three ways to power your house in America today. One, plug and pay. I made that up. <laughs> you build your house, you plug into the electricity, you pay for what you use. Two, grid tied. You build your house, you plug into the electricity, you install your solar panels, and then you give back to the electric company the power you make, and you pay the difference. Three, off-grid. You build your house, you install your solar panels, and you put the power you produce into batteries, and you power your house completely from those batteries. That's the kind of house we have. But if you live in house number one or house number two, you don't really know how much power you use. You don't really care. There's always enough. But if you're going to live off-grid, you have to know how much power you're using. How do you do that? Well, you make an inventory, just like almost anything else. You write down every electrical thingy that you use, how much you use it, how often you use it, and how much power it pulls. Ah, you know, that's never been easier than it is right now with the internet. Alexa, how much power does my dishwasher use? Bert, it depends on how much phantom load it draws. Ah, there's something we didn't know anything about. Phantom load. Phantom load is any electrical thing you have in your house that has a light, has a digital readout, or has a clock. They pull power 24-7, whether you're using them or not. You have to know what they are. So think about your stove. Think about your ovens. Think about your dishwasher. Think about your microwave. Think about your TV. Think about your computer. Think about your printer. Think about your shredder. Think about all those phone chargers that you have plugged in at home. Whether your phone is plugged in or not, they're pulling power. You have to know about these things, these energy suckers. They're important when you build off-grid. And then you have to conserve. They say you should practice for an entire year before you move in, conserving, before you move, in, move into an off-grid house. Change your, LED, your lights to LED lights. You better get used to the light, because that's the kind you're going to have. And turn off anything you're not using. And frankly, you should unplug it or put it on a power strip and turn it off. Turn off your lights. Here's a picture of my partner and I in the same room at night at our house. Now, the standard rule is when you walk into a room, you turn on the light. When you leave the room, you turn off the light. Now you have to calculate some energy for company. Because here's a picture of us in our house at night with company. <laughs> company is not, untrained company is not so great at turning off the lights. In the end, we actually doubled what we, our power projection. One, because our inventory wasn't too great, and two, because we knew we would have a lot of company. Okay, how about design? You know, we almost made a huge mistake on design. We thought we wanted a cute adobe with an interior courtyard at 7,500 feet in elevation. <coughs> Wrong vision. We hired an architect. He was talented, smart, and he told us about thermal mass all the concrete that you have to have to conserve what nature provides, passive solar. 
And then he said, and don't squander what power you can produce. Think building materials. So the conversation went on, and there were a lot of different kinds of building materials. And during the conversation, I was thinking about the three pigs. The first pig built his house out of straw, bail. <laughs> the second pig built his house out of sticks, frame. The third pig built his house out of brick, block. And then the, architect said, the, the expensive architect said these words, prefab and a gigantic double-wide trailer popped into my mind, and I thought, oh my god, have we made a mistake. But what he was talking about is something called SIPS panels, structurally insulated panels. You send your plans to a place in Montana, and they make your house, and they send it to you on a truck. That's what we have, a house on a truck. Well, actually, several trucks. But our walls are eight inches thick with an R factor, for you nerds, of 35. And our roof is 12 inches thick with an R factor of 50. A standard stick or frame construction, the walls have an R factor of between 14 and 20. And the roof, I don't know, but I can find out for you. Do you see right there those holes in each panel? There are holes. That's the channel for the electricity. It's predetermined. It comes predetermined. And if you use a SIPS, pa SIPS panels, be sure you hire electricians who, one, have off-grid uh, experience, two, are talented, three, are patient, and four, have a very good sense of humor. <laughs> because they are going to get styrofoam everywhere. It's going to be in their pockets. It's going to be in their ears. It's going to be up their nose. It's going to be in their lunch as they channel through to put in a light switch. Two years later, our electrician, Zach, calls us up and says, hey, I found some styrofoam in the most unusual place. <laughs> there are going to be problems. For example, our 60 solar panels are at what they call the summer angle. They produce really a lot of electricity, 17 kilowatts. However, in the winter when the days are shorter and the sun is lower on the horizon and our energy needs are actually greater, they should be steeper. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, that was a rookie mistake. I know that. Well, we ask people. We ask the experts. And we believed them, and they were wrong. One of the biggest challenges of building off-grid is that you have to have power to build your power system. So we thought about that in advance, and we called the solar company, and they said, OK, get your backup generator, bring it up on site, put up an outside service unit, hook into it, got the power. In the end, hook it back into the system. We did that. We bought a state-of-the-art generator, got the right kind of fuel, good to go. There is nothing quite like pulling up to your building site and seeing the contractor's pickup truck jumping the generator. It would run for two hours, it'd be dead. Jump it, run for two hours, it would be dead. As it turns out, that backup generator was a true backup generator. You have to have it hooked into the system so it recharges that little tiny battery. It wasn't recommended for off-grid application, and because of how we used it, it voided the warranty. Like I said, there will be problems. <laughs> Who do you get to do this work? You must get a fearless, problem-solving builder who is not afraid to say to you, I don't know, but I will find out. If you've decided that you're going to have a Tesla roof, and you meet with a builder, and he or she ignores you, forget them. Get a different builder. If you've decided that you're going to catch all the water off your roof, and you're going to store it on site for fire mitigation or irrigation, and they go, yeah, 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 forget them. Find a different builder. And if you hire a builder to build your off-grid house, and he or she wants to build it from standard stick construction, 
get rid of them. Hire a different builder because you will never be able to heat that house. You'll have to come over to my house. <laughs> there we go. Mother Nature will send you some adverse or challenging weather. In the spring of 2016, we had uncommonly ferocious winds, and those big ice cream sandwich-looking SIPS panels wanted to fly off into the surrounding canyons, and they were 14 feet by 20 feet, and they were heavy. So our builder found a way to brace them down. And when those 12-inch screws failed, just like that, he problem-solved and tied everything down to a 12,000-pound piece of machinery. And Mother Nature will send you adverse weather. In April, it snowed a lot. In May, it snowed the most we've ever had. <laughs> but you know, you will produce power every single day. Even on a day like that, where you could hardly see the panels, we produced 1.8 kilowatts at that moment. We we're only using half of that. And the reason is, it's because the sun is an amazing thing. She sends these little packets of energy called photons, and she sends them 93 million miles in eight and a half minutes. And every hour, she sends Earth enough photons to take care of our global energy needs for a year, if we have the technology. But speaking of technology, there are some things we need. We need an energy efficient or energy neutral convenient way to clear our solar panels. Right now, we are the invention. <laughs> and although we are energy neutral, it ain't that convenient. <laughs> because if they're covered with snow, they produce no power. On top of our house, we have solar thermal panels that uh, circulate glycol, create heat, and heat our floors and make our domestic hot water. We can't reach them from the ground, so right now, we put on climbing equipment and climb up and clear them. Invent something so we don't have to when we're 80. <laughs> Please! What we needed then and what we got was curiosity and courage. The curiosity to learn things we had no idea about controllers and inverters and monitors and all that solar stuff. I don't know how a solar panel actually works, but I have some. <laughs> and the courage to know that our project was good and was the right project. And every day when we were disappointed and disheartened and over budget, <laughs> the sun would send us a little package of encouragement in different forms, and we would go on. If we can heat and power what our friends call our giant solar house, why not your house? Why not this whole town? And frankly, why not the world? Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.